exist between Kenya and India, a relationship that spans well over a hundred years. For us in Kenya, we are a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-racial, and multi-religious society. We believe that the people of this world can live together. We welcome and open our doors to all to join hands with us as we develop to grace this occasion. For me and for India and for Indians, it's a great, great honor. And still keeping it with matters India and Kenya, let's take a look at some of uh, the business agreements that we have had uh, with India as a Kenyan economy. Now, of course, he's here on a two-day state visit, and among other issues he's going to be uh, talking about, that includes bilateral, continental, and multilateral uh, talks. Uh, but l he was actually meant to brief the media on what exactly uh, is involved in his visit here to Kenya, and uh, of course now he's meant to also have that business forum, which if he hasn't already had, he's just about to. And let's take a look at the areas of interest. Um, we're hoping that the two leaders are going to revisit the double taxation uh, avoidance agreement. It was last signed in 1989 uh, back then and he wasn't Prime Minister of India then so hopefully they are going to revisit that and uh, have another agreement signed right there. Also hoping that uh, this now makes it easier for the India Bureau of Standards uh, agreement to be signed where they're going to have some collaboration as well or cooperation with Kenya's Bureau of Standards. And uh, a draft agreement on cooperation in health. Remember that most of our pharmaceuticals come from India as well as medical equipment. But also agreements to strengthen uh, the blue economies that is the Indian Ocean states. Um, is actually also one that they could have, that is the two leaders, President Uhuru Kenyatta and the Prime Minister of India. Also, um, Kenya is seeking a preferential status from Indian authorities for its goods and agreements as well to support telemedicine, uh, e-commerce, e-governance, resource mapping, as well as tele-education. India is big when it comes to technology. Um, so let's also take a look at uh, the already existing trade ties between the two countries. Kenya's exports to India among the top ones. We have tea, coffee and spices. We also have leather and wool. We have soda ash which is actually among the top exports to India. Scrap metal as well and precious stones that is uh, rubies as well as pearls. And uh, Kenya's imports from India. We have medical equipment and pharmaceuticals just like I mentioned earlier. And of course vehicles. Um, we know a number of companies in the country today that is Tata, Honda and Bajaj. Bajaj is big on uh, the model cycles and Honda as well motorcycles and vehicles and Tata is, is all round. I'm sure you've seen the rickshaws uh, that we have in the country today or uh, tuk-tuks. Those are all from India. And uh, let's look at um, what the two countries have been able to benefit from each other. Um, in regard to annual tourism, you know, we have about 5,000 Kenyans who visit India on an annual basis. But most of the uh, Kenyans who go to India are going for medical, um, you know, uh, treatment. Some of them are going to buy medical equipment or drugs and still come back uh, to Kenya. But the Indians who visit Kenya are mostly business tourists. And we have about 50,000 who come to the country every year. Exports, uh, by the end of April of 2016, India had exported to Kenya or at least we had imported from India goods worth about 201 billion Kenyan shillings. Uh, if you compare that to what we export to India, there's quite a bit of um, big difference actually. 7.8 billion shillings is what we exported or worth of goods that we exported to India. So you can see that there's a bit of an imbalance there and hopefully um, the Prime Minister's visit can be able 
to find solutions to at least bridging that gap a little bit. So that's just a look at um, some of the areas of interest uh, between Kenya and India's trade ties. Now let's also take a look at other stories and uh, Barclays Bank of Kenya has rolled out free training to small and medium-sized enterprise owners and uh, the Wazesha Biashara and a Barclays program that is targeting over 10,000 small and medium-sized enterprise owners across the country. The training uh, seminars which will be held in 11 towns aim to enable business owners to run, create and improve professionalism in what they structure and run, in how they structure and run their businesses. Speaking at the launch of the initiative in Kisumu City, Barclays Bank of Kenya, head of retail and business banking, Humphrey Muturi, reaffirmed that the bank's commitment to the SME sector and highlighted the critical role SMEs play in enhancing the country's economy. First thing is to interact with our valued SME customers, both existing customers as well as prospective SME customers to Barclays Bank, and to reassure them of our commitment of support for them and their business in the long haul. The second reason we are here is to bring to these customers information and financial literacy in the form of a workshop that is around finance for non-finance managers. The race to rescue paralyzed Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industry heats up with elections set to be held on Thursday. Uh, various aspirants have been traversing the counties in a bid to seek support from the 470 delegates expected to elect the new officer, uh, office in charge. And uh, Sharif Ahmed, who aims to dislodge the current chairman, Kiprono Kitoni, yesterday met delegates from Nyanza region where he promised to revamp the chamber at the county level. Ahmed has teamed up with Lebanon DT, Kitonia's deputy, who decamped to join him in what he termed as thirst for change in the chamber leadership due to their shared vision. Ahmed further accused the current office of mismanaging the chamber's funds, a situation which has seen activities at the county's uh, chapter paralyzed. First, resor first resources, we are going to country 80% of the resources will go directly to the counties. Only 20% will remain at the counter. Then any foreign trips, it is going to be not one county. It is going to be distributed across the county. It will be rotational. If one county travels one time, even presidential uh, trips, it is going to be distributed according to the counties, not from the national office or not the same people all the time. The maturity in the chamber is... Um is, 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 is growing uh, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, the delegates will be able to understand by under looking what has been there before what has not been done and what we think that we can do and as you all know that the chair is the principal head of the institution the vice only complement the chair Away from that, listed cement producer Bamburi Cement has cut 71 uh, jobs and this as it strives to reorganize itself into a leaner and more efficient organization. According to its recently published annual report, Bamburi paid out 192 million shillings to send home the affected employees who were either laid off or opted for a voluntary retirement. The layoffs uh, reduced its workforce to 851 employees from 932 the previous year and 936 in 2013. The company, which enjoys the largest market share in the cement industry, has to contend with declining margins as competitors lower prices to grow their top line. Last year, Bamburi Cement recorded a 40% growth in net profit to 4.3 billion shillings attributed to supplies to large infrastructure projects, including road construction and the Standard Gauge Railway.
Now, let's take a look at what sustainable development goals mean for us in regard to climate change. And sustainable development goal number 13 states take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Climate change is now affecting every country on every continent. It is disrupting national economies and affecting lives, costing people, communities and countries uh, dearly today and even more tomorrow if we do not do something about it. People are experiencing the significant impacts of climate change, which include changing weather patterns, rising sea level and more extreme weather events. The greenhouse gas emissions from human activity are driving climate change and continue to rise. They are now at their highest levels in history. Without action, the world's average surface temperature is projected to rise to over the 21st century and is likely to surpass 3 degrees Celsius uh, this century, with some areas of the world expected to warm even more. The poorest and most vulnerable people are being affected the most. Affordable, scalable solutions are now available to enable countries leapfrog uh, to clear more resilient economies. Now, the pace of change is quickening as more people are turning to renewable energy and a range of other measures that will reduce emissions and increase adaptation efforts. But can we do more to reverse the effects of climate change to enable our economies progress? And just how, emerg how can emerging economies leverage on climate change uh, to grow our economies? Joining us now to help us understand more about climate change and emerging economies is Richard Munang, who is the coordinator for UNEP, Africa Climate Change. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Richard. A lot is happening in the world today in regard to sustainable development goals, but more even when it comes to climate change. And uh, we might not exactly see it today, but we cannot deny the effects of climate change today. Um, would you say that African economies are doing something about it? I think actually, despite the fact that Africa have contributed very little mm -hmm. to the emissions that are causing climate change in the world, right. Africa is actually providing solutions. For example, before the Conference of Parties mm -hmm. last year, December in Paris, Africa went there not just to complain but actually to provide solutions. And one of the solutions which they provided was they came up with two initiatives mm -hmm. one on how to harness the on top renewable energy. Right. Uh, which the continent today harbors in quite an abundance and at the same time also a program on an Africa adaptation initiative. So Africa is providing solutions on this front. Okay. And, uh, you know, with the passage of uh, the Paris Agreement, just like you mentioned, th there's been quite some bit of optimism uh, that has been seen on the African continent. But um, how do we even leverage on this in regard to taking action? The Paris Agreement for the first time actually provides an opportunity for mm -hmm. each and every country as compared to what was agreed in 1992 called the Kyoto Protocol, which was only applicable for developed countries. But this time around, the Paris Agreement provides a level playing field for countries in the developing uh, continent or in the developing world to be able to tap into opportunities. And mm -hmm. one of these opportunities is how can you be able to develop in such a way that you are not adding emissions but at the same time tapping into the opportunities that exist? For example, the Paris Agreement comes with what is called the Intended National Determined Contributions and these are actually country plans which were submitted mm -hmm. before the Conference of Parties last year, 2015 December. Right. And Africa actually submitted these plans and within this plan, 60% of these plans are actually land-based, which means that they are focused on agricultural activities mm -hmm. done in such a way that uh, the emissions which are supposed to be actually uh, harbored under the ground are not emitted to uh, add to the greenhouse gases. And part of this is also focused on energy, but energy from clean sources like solar, like wind, like hydro, which the continent today is only using 10% of the over 1,000 terawatts that mm -hmm. exist. Mm -hmm. So Africa could tap into this Paris Agreement and create jobs, especially in catalytic sectors like agriculture, which today mm -hmm. employs 65% of the entire workforce in the continent. But at the same time, it could also tap in the energy sector, which I have mentioned, and ensuring that the activities which could actually be used to enhance agricultural production right. are working with nature and not against nature. That is ensuring that the environment is intact. What is called ecosystems, are rivers, are forests, are soils managed in such a way that you are not emitting 
carbon into the atmosphere, but at the same time enhancing yields mm -hmm. and linking these across the entire agro value chain by utilizing clean energy yeah. like solar, like mm -hmm. wind, could create jobs up to about 17 million, right. as studies have shown. And the World Bank report projected that and the agro economy in 15 years could be worth 1 trillion US dollars. All right. So it all seems, you know, beautiful to listen to. Uh, but then again, when it comes to taking action, we don't seem to be taking the right action. And maybe one would say this is tied to the fact that we lack the resources uh, to enable us even take the necessary action. So how exactly do we finance uh, climate action? Actually, resources are actually the elephants in the room. Mm -hmm. In 2015, the UN Environment Programme, in collaboration with partners, released a report called the Second Africa Adaptation Gap Report, which shows that if the world was to hit two degrees, which probability is quite very high that it could hit two degrees, the African continent will need up to 50 billion US dollars a year between now and 2050. But if the world was to hit four degrees, the continent would need 100 billion US dollars mm -hmm. to be able to build resilient systems and actually adapt to the changing climate. But the report also shows that if Africa was to look internally, which is actually something which the Paris Agreement presented, that in as much as developed countries are supposed to support with financial report, I mean with financial support, in developing countries could also voluntarily look internally to be able to generate uh, revenue to build their climate resilience. However, it is quite very important to say that the capitalization of what is called the Green Climate Fund, currently above 11 billion today, may not be able to address all the challenges that the continent of Africa is facing vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the skyrocketing amounts that I've mentioned, ranging 50 billion if the world was to remain below a two degree and 100 billion USD if the world was to reach four degrees. So right. it's therefore paramount for the continent to look internally and there are actually areas where the continent could look internally in addition to leveraging international financial support. And mm -hmm. one of these is, if you look at the entire agro value chain today, the continent is losing 48 billion US dollars as a result of inefficiencies in the agro value chain, mm -hmm. whether it is as a result of post harvest loss because there's lack of adding value to the agricultural products, or it is as a result of transportation to market, which then could be an area that could actually be looked into to be able to, reserve, to reverse these 48 billion US dollars. But mm -hmm. the worst of all is the continent is spending 35 billion US dollars every year importing food. And if the continent was to utilize these approaches which are mentioned, yeah. working with nature, not against nature, they could be able to reverse this. And the continent is also losing 68 billion US dollars as a result of land degradation every year. Mm -hmm. So if they were actually able to utilize practical approaches which have been proven to work, working with nature and protecting ecosystems, they could then reverse this amount of money that they're losing and actually inject this into climate resilient activities in the continent. Right. So what we're seeing on the African continent is extreme weather patterns. Uh, temperatures are too high, which maybe many a time causes drought. And uh, maybe we have heavy floods in, you know, in parts of Kenya as well as other parts of the continent. So how exactly do we tap into the younger generation. We have about 75% of our population on the African continent being the youthful uh, population. So how do we tap into that generation to ensure that we are securing the future of our continent? This is an excellent question. We are talking at a time when the population of the African continent is just a little bit above 1.1 billion as we speak today. Mm -hmm. And in less than 35 years, this will hit 2.4 billion. Yeah. But as you said, the youthful population is just above 200 million and projected to reach 400 million in less than 20 years from today. Yeah. At the same time, you have 60% of this youthful population unemployed. And the question should then be, how do we create the jobs, as rightly put, but it is these jobs are going to come in areas that are highly catalytic. And these sectors that are highly catalytic are the agricultural sector and also the energy sector. Mm -hmm. So still, if you do tell these within Agenda 2063 of the African Union and the Sustainable Development Goals, there is an opportunity to leverage these global continental blueprints global from sustainable development goals to the right. Paris Agreement and then the continental the agenda 2063 which provide the framework to be able to utilize what 
these catalytic sectors uh, actually have to do in terms of creating jobs and mm -hmm. the UN Environment Programme in collaboration with partners came up with what is called the Ecosystem Based Adaptation for Food Security Assembly. Yeah. And the ultimate premise of this is how do you bring everyone together to be able to address cross-cutting issues like climate change, like food security, like addressing poverty and ensuring that you're moving away from conferences but domesticating ideas right at the national level and bringing those who have ideas from the private sector, bringing those from policy making, bringing those from civil societies, mm -hmm. from NGOs and bringing youth to be able to use their talent to address climate change and actually also create jobs. Right. And this has actually been rolled out across the entire continent today. And as I speak today, there are 35 countries that have set up these national branches, and Kenya is actually one of them. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate end goal is to be able to address the job unemployment challenges we're facing today. We cannot look beyond the already opportunities that are already existing, but it would be good to look at these catalytic sectors. They are the agricultural sector so as we well as the renewable that. energy mm -hmm. to transition towards a low emissions development pathway and at the same time ensure that structural transformation can be able to happen Great. Well, thank you so much, Richard Munang. He is the Regional Climate Change Coordinator uh, at the Regional Office for Africa, that is UNEP, or United Nations Environment Programme. Thank you so much for sharing your views. Now, thank we you. are heading towards the UNCTAD conference that is later this month, and uh, conversations about climate change and uh, trade and cooperation are also taking part. Uh, we'll take the bigger part of uh, that conference, so we'll continue to have those conversations towards uh, the UNCTAD conference. Now, five months since the removal of the Kenya Ports Authority Managing Director Gishiri Ndua, pressure has started building up for the state to name his substantive successor. Six names are on the card with the State Corporations Board expected to forward three names for a decision to be made by Transport Cabinet Secretary James Masharia. And as KTN's Coast reporter Francis Ontomwa now explains, uh, perceived emerging political interests will heavily influence the quest for a new KPA boss. It's Eastern Central Africa's busiest port along the East African coastline, providing connectivity to over 80 ports worldwide. And now the race is heating up on who will grab the steering wheels of this giant state corporation, a race that rests the spotlight family on the agency's board, headed by former cabinet minister Mazden Madoka. And just like it has played out traditionally, political interests are weighing in. This time around, we are looking very closely to see how the employment is going to, to take place. Otherwise, we are going to organize ourselves into uh, a block that will actually resist and will demand that uh, our people should be employed. Reports from KPA indicate that 36 candidates applied for the job, including two current section managers at the port. The number was later whittled down to six of the best, interviewed between 4th and 10th of June. The six include the current acting MD Catherine Muturi Wairi and KPA General Manager Technical Services Engineer Joseph Atonga. Others include Daniel Manduku of the National Construction Authority, Stanley Chai, a maritime consultant based in Mombasa, Zakayo Ole Mapelu, the MD of the East Africa Portland Cement, and a Mrs. Grace Kimei Chelagat. We have competent, educated, experienced natives. But I'm repeating my statements again. This position must be earned and given on merit and professionalism, not on political considerations alone. In February this year, the then KPA MD Gishirin Rua and some top managers of the port were sacked over corruption. And there are some coastal leaders who feel the position should now go to a native, as well as 70% of the port's workforce divided among locals. But there are reservations. The Kenya Ports Authority belongs to Kenya. And as it belongs to Kenya, every Kenyan can can have the cake the ejection of Nduwa notwithstanding the port saw its revenue show up significantly with the port handling more than a million containers in 2014 and its revenue shooting up to over 30.7 billion shillings the delay in getting a new md however is now raising concerns i want to see a kpa with full of professionals and with the people who knows and understand how the ports operate. Sources at the port indicate that the board has been meeting to try and bridge alleged differences emerging among members over their appointments. Highly placed sources say, however, that the board has already settled 
on the last three names to be forwarded to Transport CS. From what we understand is uh, there was a, a shortlisted list of uh, candidates and they went for the first interview almost two months ago. And uh, the results of the same were never declared. And then later we were told that they were supposed to go for a second interview. That interview was cancelled two days. And that already raises a lot of uh, uh, gaps. I cannot. It's unethical and professional for me to start divulging anything we've discussed at the board until such time that we have decided to make it public. The multi-billion establishment remains key in the economy of Kenya and consequently eyes will now remain glued as to who finally takes up the hot seat and steer KPA to higher levels. Pressure is now mounting on Transport Cabinet Secretary James Masharia to name the new Managing Director for Kenya Ports Authority. This even as perceived emerging political interests threaten to mar the quest to set the right credentials. Francis Ontomwa, KTN News, at the Kenya Ports Authority, Mombasa. All right, now dairy breeders in Kisumu County are gearing up for the upcoming Brookside Breeders Show slated for the end of July. Our Kisumu-based reporter Rashid Ronald filed the following report. To teach an animal handler at Mazao Yetu Limited in Koru. He is training a Boran bull ahead of the Brookside Livestock Breeder Show and Sale to be held on 21st July at Nairobi's Jamhuri Park. Jimmy Brooks is the managing director of the company and the chairman of the Brookside Livestock and Breeder Show and Sell. He tells me that the bulls have to be thoroughly trained ahead of the big competition. Basically, you've got to tame them. Okay, so we started working with some of these animals in about December last year. And it's uh, getting them used to having a cumber around their head and just being pulled and, and led around. You, br you start brushing them. You uh, getting them used to being being handled on their legs, their back, their head, and everything, so that you can actually can they can be held. Um, you know, you've got to try and familiarise them with uh, crowds of people. You know, when you go into the into the main arena, there, there's going to be loudspeakers going. There's lots of tents. There's um, flags waving. There's a lot of noise and everything like that. So it's no good bringing an animal just straight from here to there and they're expecting it to keep still. When it's the three-day show that has been sponsored by Brooks at Dairy Company will attract exhibitors from several countries including South Africa and Namibia. You have different classes depending on the age of the animal, both females and, and males. You have a class for up to two years old and then a class for two to two and a half and then a class for two to two and a half to three years in the females. And then the bulls are also go to up to three years, uh, sorry, three to four, and then four to five. Um, so you've got the different classes. And then the winner, I mean, each, the, normally the, the judge, if the animals are good enough, will award first, second, third, and fourth. Owners of the winning dairy cows and bulls will receive several prizes, including cash. Rashid Ronald, KTN News, in the county of Kisumu. The short-term implications of Brexit for African economies will be mainly noticeable through market volatility. However, according to Control Risks and uh, NKC African Economics, uh, the longer-term impacts on Africa from Brexit are speculative and depend as much on the attitude of future British uh, governments as on the terms of exit. The longer-term implications hinge on what the terms of Britain leaving the EU are and how this feeds through transmission a mechanism to Africa through trade, aid and soft power as well as political influence. According to the Director for Africa Analysis, Jean Devlin, the impact of Brexit for the continent will be defined by the global agenda in the coming months as political risk has increased in Europe and with the election in the US later this year there is less scope for international cooperation to address issues of particular relevance to African economies or African countries such as peace and security issues development and impacts of climate change he also said that the implications may be a continuation featured by Europe's increasingly diverse sources of investment from outside Africa and added that Britain will still retain cultural and trade links through uh, the Commonwealth, but outside the EU bloc will likely be more reliant on its own diplomatic channels.
All right, and talking about the impact of Brexit on African economies, in studio we are joined by uh, members of the Public Finance and Tax Committee of ASPAC, um, a good number of them. They're here to talk about uh, post-budget, but also to talk about Brexit. And I think we'll start with Brexit being the immediate issue. Uh, we have Philip Mwema, who is uh, from Nexus, and we also have uh, Michael Mbarugu at my extreme left, who is from PKF. And uh, finally, to the center right there, we have Francis Kamau, who is from EY. Uh, all of them are tax partners at the different uh, companies right there. But they are members of the Public Finance and Tax Committee of S Thank you both, all, actually, for joining us. Um, I will start with Philip. Um, you know, Brexit has been talked about, I guess, for the past so many weeks since Britain voted to leave the European Union. But um, do you think, from, from your perspective, do you think we are actually being too optimistic about it or uh, we need to continue being speculative? I think, that, I think we need to be more speculative because we, if you look at uh, the move by Brexit, Brexit uh, mm -hmm. The leaving of the EU and the immediate impact even in the EU. Yeah. In fact, my, my view, I think, is looking through the move that Britain has done, where the world has become flat and this globalization, mm -hmm. they've gone on the extreme left. Um, it's high time maybe for Africans to start thinking, it's high time to conquer Britain in terms of uh, going <laughs> into it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Francis, what do you think about uh, the whole Brexit issue? Was it a mistake for, for them to actually decide they now wanted to leave the EU? Uh, I think uh, if you look at Africa, actually we are trying to come up together. Mm -hmm. Actually we are creating a mega economic block for Africa. So trying to combine EAC, Comesa and all that to one mega body. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at what is happening at uh, Brexit, uh, mm -hmm. at UK for mm -hmm. that particular matter, mm -hmm. I think they are going against the grain in terms of uh, uh, economic uh, you know, creation, in terms of wealth creation, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. So having said that, um, maybe we can see a bit of a uh, you know, a good way of uh, appreciating it as Commonwealth countries because, of course, we'll be having, you know, a uh, few considerations in terms of migration and all that from a UK perspective. Mm -hmm. Being mm -hmm. Kenya is a member of a uh, Commonwealth, so to speak. But from a larger perspective, in their own analysis and in their own uh, agenda, I presume they are lost, so to speak. All right. Yeah. And uh, Michael, you know, some people would actually say, you know, if it worked for them over these past 43 years or so, um, and now they are deciding to, you know, leave the EU, um, what does that mean for us as African economies? Are we building something that we will later want to break away from, um, you know, in the spirit of we can now go it alone? Yeah, well, I would imagine that uh, in the minds of the Britons when they voted to exit from the EU, yeah. they obviously do have some uh, good reasons and those reasons have been stated. Obviously, um, they have stated the fact that they are one of the countries actually who on a year basis do honor uh, their financial obligations to the EU. You'll find some, uh, you know, Eastern Europe countries that have joined the EU, including mm -hmm. some uh, broke uh, European countries like Italy. Yeah. They, they tend to be weighing <laughs> down, especially of the younger people. And if you look at the trend, it's the young people who really did want to be bogged behind yeah. or back ones uh, in terms of financial commitments by their existence in the EU. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think it, the, perhaps they would have expressed themselves differently in terms of negotiating within the EU and pushing more responsibilities to the countries that are not participating well Right. Uh, within the, that framework. So I, I think when you have a problem in your house, you don't, you don't burn it. You sort out your problems from right inside the house. They were a bit <laughs> unstrategic in that respect, but yeah. I think there are they are varying reasons why the young people in, in, in Britain feel yeah. that uh, their existence in the EU is weighing too much on their future. On their future, so right. there are varying reasons. Uh, All right. So as we await for the triggering of Article 50, I guess we can only just speculate and see what exactly is going to happen. Um, but now it's a month since uh, the budget was read out to Kenyans by a CS for National Treasury, Henry Rotich. And uh, some, some people say it was a pro one budget. 
it's now a month since and I guess the one that was most talked about was uh, the tax on cosmetics and also the increased taxes on kerosene. Uh, but these tax partners are going to help us understand exactly how this could bite into your pocket uh, in the next year, or at least this financial year of 2016-2017. So uh, Philip, I'm going to start with you. Um, I remember the, the most thing that maybe people underestimated because probably it was overtaken by the events of the tax on cosmetics was that on kerosene. Um, do you think that this is going to impact heavily on the ordinary Kenyan? Absolutely. If, if you look at uh, the introduction of excess duty on kerosene, mm -hmm. which is used uh, largely in, uh, by Wanjiko, so yeah. that we've now coined Wanjiko as, as, as a person, mm -hmm. the thinking behind uh, introducing the excess duty on kerosene was to protect the adulteration of our fuel yeah. because then our neighbors, our neighboring countries, uh, Uganda, uh, Congo, mm -hmm. while we're looking yeah. at uh, Rwanda, not, not passing through their fuel within Kenya because of adulteration. Mm -hmm. Now, with that move as a, as a way to protect that industry uh, on the white fuels and, and black fuels, so to speak, we introduce an excess duty on kerosene, but the multiplier effect on that is the people who use kerosene um, in terms of just uh, the, the sheer numbers are huge, mm -hmm. from Mukuru Kwanjenga to across in, in Kibera, Katwekera. Uh, mm -hmm. If you go to Katwikera in Kibera, I bet you know where Katwikera is. I do. Oh, yeah, great. So me, you, if, you look at, <laughs> if, if you look at the population that, that, that's using kerosene, it's huge. Then you increase, uh, that, that it's a basic commodity uh, for them, cares living below a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, in a, in a pre-election year, I don't think it was a very bold move. All right. Um, and, you know, we, we can actually talk about this, but uh, I guess because we want to go through so many issues uh, in, in the limited time we have, let's also talk about uh, the road maintenance levy. Uh, and I think this is also one of them that is going to bite quite a bit uh, into our pockets. Francis, you want to highlight on that? Um, how exactly do you think we are meant to be paying more of than we should have been paying uh, with the RML? Uh one of the things is that uh, maybe I can go to the impact specifically yeah. uh, in terms of the rise uh, in, uh, you know, the, the costs, especially when you come to the pocket of uh, Mona mm -hmm. And I presume uh, one of the things is that um, uh, the fuels which you are talking about here, which will be, uh, the Mona will be paying the uh, roads maintenance levy, uh, basically one of them is transport actually is going to affect the transport and I think as uh, my colleague has mentioned it is basically touching to the pocket uh, of the real Monainchi mm -hmm. uh, so to speak mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also having said that it's also going to affect uh, you know the general populace in terms of the cost of generating wealth in this particular country so just like uh, the way he has talked about uh, uh, you know the issue of the kerosene so to speak uh, it has a ripple effect and multiply effect. In fact, what we can do for now, uh, there's no study which has done to see uh, actually uh, the multiplicity, multiplicity of factors, so mm -hmm. to speak, in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, you know, we can basically put a figure of a percentage. But this multiplicity, because the Matatu guy is going to increase the cost of fare, and again, onto that, the particular person who is using that particular vehicle, who is a trader, is also going to increase the cost of the goods. And that multiplicity of factors is what is basically going to be humongous, so mm -hmm. to speak, when you look at uh, the larger perspective. All right. Um, you know, also during his uh, budget statement, he talked about the fact that I think uh, landlords were going to get some sort of relief, uh, but that only applied to those who were able to put up a thousand units in a year. And some people thought, you know, that was a far-fetched dream for one landlord to put out a thousand units in a year. It's more like, uh, you know, um, impossible. But Michael, what do you think about about, about this do you think it's something that is really going to help us maybe get to a level where we're seeing housing uh, affordability going down or becoming right. more yeah. affordable well I, I think the initiative for 1,000 uh, residential units mm -hmm. uh, to qualify for a preferential tax of 20% instead of 30% is a good initiative but yeah. it's, it's a mute law as it is created because there's no single developer in this country who will achieve 1,000 units within one year, unless the government obviously has in mind the 
Mabati type of houses that you find in the slums, and I don't think that is what the intention is. So clearly, I think for me the fundamental issue that the government need to address are two things. The cost of land in this country is exaggerated, is exaggerated and that is the main cost for anybody doing development, mm -hmm. and the cost of borrowing in excess of 20%. So what the government ought to be doing, in my view, is to have clear land policy that will ensure that people who are in such housing schemes get this land at affordable rates, num number one. Number two is to do something about the borrowing rates for as long as those two items have not been addressed. It's not going to be possible for the housing costs to come down. It's right. always going to bog down the developers and giving an incentive of a 20% corporation tax mm -hmm. on those who do about 1,000 units every year. It's a mute point, as I said. It's not going to work. It's actually just going to remain in paper. All right. My, um, I, I do tend to have a different view on that, Michael, because mm -hmm. if you look at... Um, the low-cost housing, yeah. it's not your conventional brick and mortar that's targeted for. Mm -hmm. I think this incentive ideally is meant to um, trigger innovation within the construction sector. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in the last, I think, uh, three months, we've seen a lot of low-cost housing coming up with panels, the, prefab the prefabricated uh, panels. Mm -hmm. And with the prefabricated panels, if then uh, I think a thousand units with that kind of thinking on the pre uh, pre panels uh, yeah. being done around the country, mm -hmm. it's achievable. So I think that the whole idea is, uh, my thinking is, innovation coming out of the construction sector, we don't go the traditional brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. Maybe now it's high time we now embrace uh, Right. Uh, around the country. Okay. Um, well, my director is telling me we're out of time and I wish we really had more time for this conversation. But you know, the finance bill is coming up and uh, we are going to have yet another opportunity to talk more about this. But I would like to say thank you so much to uh, my guests, uh, Philip Mwema, who is at, at my immediate left. Um, he is a partner at Nexus Business Advisory. And we also have uh, Francis Kamau, who is a tax partner at EY, and Michael Barugo, who is a partner at uh, PKF. Thank you all so much for joining us on this edition of Business Today. Coming up next is World View with Akisa Wandera. So you want to look out for that and also some views on uh, the fighting that broke out in South Sudan. You might want to look out for uh, that conversation she's going to be having with the South Sudan ambassador. Do stay tuned to KTN News.